Simple Explanation of Work Ideas by Maurice Nicole Chapter 10 The more our outward man dies away, the more living is the inward. St. Paul Man consists of two parts, essence and personality. Essence is the part that can grow. At birth a person is essence, but it is undeveloped. The baby has to grow, and each center has to develop its mind and intelligence. A baby lives in instinctive center. Little by little it begins to develop in moving center, to walk. It understands scarcely anything. Life is at a great distance from it, and it lives in its own world. When it begins to speak and understand something of what people are saying, life comes nearer. Personality begins to be formed. Life comes in as impressions, which fall on the different centers and form rolls. Impressions are deposited on rolls in the different centers. At birth, the centers are blank, save the instinctive center, and a small part of moving center. Everything we have learnt is stored in these centers. All our habits, mental, emotional, and physical, are stored in these rules. By means of these rules, personality is built. People with similar rules may feel connected, and those with dissimilar ones may feel at a loss with one another. But people who have different rules, who differ in personality, may feel drawn to one another. In such cases, it is some similarity in essence. We have to understand that essence is very soon surrounded by personality. What we are born with is surrounded by what we acquire. Beliefs, opinions, customs, etc. What we are taught forms personality. What essence is, what we really are, remains undeveloped. But a man only grows through a new growth of essence. If in life we wish to be the foremost authority on some subject and study to do so, we increase personality. If we do something solely to be first, all our efforts lead solely to a growth of personality, and this will be at the expense of essence. In esoteric teaching, man is regarded as a seed capable of individual development. The part of man that can grow as a seed is essence. But during our upbringing, our sense of ourselves, our feeling of I, gradually shifts from what we really are to what we acquire from life. Strictly speaking, essence is what we are. Personality is what is not us. Through a vague feeling of this, people sometimes try to avoid life. But though it is true that simple people are more essential, their essence has not developed beyond a certain point. Their understanding remains that of a child. The work says that essence is capable of only a very small development by itself. In order to grow beyond a certain point, it must have food. An acorn feeds first on the substance that surrounds the germ of life contained in it. When it has developed as a plant, it draws nourishment from the sun and the earth. With us, the point is to form food in us that later can feed essence. This food is the personality. Unless personality forms itself round essence by the action of life, essence cannot grow further than a certain point. Essence can grow by itself up to four, five, or six, say. It then stops. A child then leaves its essence and becomes more and more immersed in the slowly forming personality. It is taught what to believe in, what is useful, and so on. A confusion of things. But this work says that despite this, personality must be formed, because if we wish at a later stage of life to grow individually, we cannot do so without this food of personality. We can only grow at the expense of personality. What is the inner situation of man as regards his possible individual development? Man has created a self-developing organism. The real development is the development of what is really him what he was born with, the growth of essence. Through education and external circumstances in general, and through imagination, personality takes charge of us. 
Personality becomes active and essence passive. This means that we believe in all we have imitated, this side we have acquired, and take as ourselves. It can be to the extent that all that is real in us practically dies. Nevertheless, personality must form itself in a man to relate him to life, and the richer the personality, the better. But it is only a step towards development. Development begins when all this food is made disposable to essence for its further growth. In other words, the development of essence can only take place at the expense of personality and of certain results of its formation in us. We can only grow by making personality passive. This enables the essence little by little to become active and grow. So if we desire to change, we have to begin to go against ourselves in a certain way, against what we take to be ourselves. All the psychological teaching of this system is connected with the central idea of a development of essence at the expense of personality. A development that is impossible unless personality has been formed first of all, since it depends on personality for its fulfillment, and particularly on the quality of the food that is stored in personality. Chapter 11 The question of the development of essence does not lie in trying to find what in essence itself should develop. It is not a matter of making essence develop, as it were, by force, but of allowing it to develop. Essence cannot develop because it is surrounded by personality. A particular side of personality is false personality. It is said that false personality is constructed out of imagination. Imagination is one of the most powerful forces acting on our inner life in the inner world of reality in which we live. Take an example of, in early years, reading a book and imagining oneself the hero. We believe ourselves to be what imagination tells us. When imagination has been consented to, a false feeling of oneself is created, a false feeling of I. This is the basis of false personality. As we grow up and personality is formed, Instead of being ourselves, we cease to be ourselves and gradually become an invented person. The center of gravity of the feeling of ourselves passes into the artificial feeling of I, which is composed of imagination. For the essential feeling of oneself is substituted a misleading feeling of I. It is this invented side, this imaginary I, or false personality that prevents essence from growing later on in life. False personality is our self-liking, self-love, self-admiration, and the source of self-pity and negative emotions. The development of essence after personality has been formed depends on rendering false personality and imaginary I passive. That means that we have to discover by self-observation what is real and what is false in us. For in personality there is both much that is useful and much that is useless. But we have to see that we imagined ourselves first in some grand walk of life and are actually ordinary. As false personality is composed of imagination, we must try to observe some of its forms. Try to observe lying. For instance, telling a story in such a way as to put oneself in a favorable position, to make oneself appear more clever or more in the right than one is. We don't like admitting we are wrong. We are the slave of our imaginary I, for at all costs we feel bound to keep it alive and defend it both from others and ourselves. Consequently, we are always lying, by boasting, justifying, and pretending and we seek the satisfaction of being taken seriously by other people, by asking for praise and encouragement. If we fail in this, we feel depressed and hurt, or hate people. The false personality in people injures relationships. They cannot be real, for it is pretense of the imagination. If the essence of one person is attracted by another's essence, something real is possible if personality does not ruin the situation. 
A child, from being real in its early years, is then, from the necessity of having to meet outer life, forced to imitate other people. It begins to be something not itself, and to believe in it. The feeling of I passes outwards into the growing personality, and owing to this formation of personality there is nothing real in the sense of this feeling of I. Everything the child imitates and invents concerning itself forms many different eyes. So when grown up, we are a conglomeration of eyes which may act in different ways at different times. But imaginary I, or false personality, acts in such a way as to make us believe that we are one and the same person at all times. We are sure that we have a single, unchanging, and permanent I. Unless we realize we are not like this, we cannot change. For we also believe that we have real will, and can do. But we are a house in disorder. We are many people, each with a desire, not one person with one will. This is why we cannot do. Only a man with real individuality has a real will and can do. When we begin to observe ourselves with the aim of seeing different personalities, the power of imaginary eye begins to be weakened. We see we are different from what we imagined ourselves to be. When we really see the different eyes speaking, an illusion about ourselves begins to be destroyed, and we pass a little nearer to the state in which real I can come nearer. As long as false personality is in power, essence will be incapable of growth. But once we begin to realize our situation, essence is no longer held in check. Our inner situation begins to alter, and as personality becomes passive, so does essence develop and become active. Chapter 12 Personal Efforts a Man Must Make In order to change himself, a man must work on himself. But there are both useful and useless efforts. As an example of useless effort, Take the instance of an irritable man who, hearing of this system and not understanding it, gives up smoking. The result is that he becomes even more irritable. Effort must be intelligent, and it must be based on the direction the work teaches, and on what we have observed in ourselves in relation to the teaching. Unless we have observed ourselves and seen what we have to work on, Nothing useful can result from any efforts we make. If one has observed one is irritable, one is in a position to work on oneself usefully. All efforts must be made useful in one of three respects, to the work itself, or to others in the work, or to oneself. The first line of work is to change the kind of person one is. The second line of work is in connection with one's neighbors, those with whom one is working, who are nearest and understanding. The third line of work concerns the work itself. For instance, we must think of what might harm it and what might help it, and realize that if we behave badly or talk badly, we harm the work itself and other people in it, and ourselves, so that without seeing the reason, we can no longer work on ourselves. The teaching lays down these three lines of work. No one can work only for himself. The first useful effort we can make is the effort of self-observation, learning to observe ourselves uncritically. This requires great and continual effort because it must be done consciously. Try to observe for a short given period, for we have not the force to observe longer, thoughts, emotions, sensations, movements. It is necessary to find the right state internally, where we really want to observe and realize that we can by seeing, for instance, that we think one thing and feel something quite different. Ordinarily we are identified with everything that takes place within us, every thought, mood, sensation, emotion. This means that we take it as ourselves. We put the feeling of I into it, and for this reason nothing can change in us. 
Let us return to the irritable man. Suppose he fully observes his irritation. Then his situation has changed, because instead of being identified and being his irritation, he is to a certain extent separated from it. He is separated because he can observe it as something which is not himself. He can see it as an object. He has drawn out of it the feeling of I. And the greater the power of his self-observation, the less power will the irritation have over him. He is no longer so identified with himself. This has been brought about by the establishment of observing I, the first step in making a new system in us, which is the first practical aim of the teaching. The greatest hindrance to self-evolution is that we are constantly identified with what attracts our attention at a given moment, and for this reason we forget ourselves. But our natural right is the third state of consciousness, the state of self-remembering. Unless we can begin to self-remember, we are identified with everything. We thus live in a state of inner disorder, identifying with our surroundings. That is why we are said to be asleep. We are so accustomed to identification that we only feel the taste of being identified. When we identify with a problem, a person, a feeling, a situation, we put ourselves under its power. We are mastered by it. Self-mastery begins with struggling with identifying. It is possible, too, to identify with working on oneself by forgetting that one's small aim is not everything. Aim must not be done publicly. That causes identifying and gives no result. It is particularly difficult to free ourselves from identifying because we feel our best work is done by being identified. By being identified, we see only one side of a question. If we are an instinctive man, for instance, we identify with the food we are especially fond of. Instinctive man becomes the steak he eats. We become whatever we are identified with. Money, woes, hatred, etc. And cannot remember ourselves. To remember ourselves, we must not identify. To learn how not to identify, we must first not be identified with ourselves. For this reason, we must learn and practice self-observation. When we realize we need not go with a mood, etc., but can draw the feeling of I out of it, we begin to see what not identifying with ourselves means. The best ideas are usually so simple, it seems hard to believe they didn't always exist. <laughs>